Hello, and welcome to another episode of Crad COVID Readings. I'm Keith R. Andy Candido, here with part one of three of a reading of another of my tales of Cassie Zukov, Weirdness Magnet. Y'all have been hearing lots of these stories and over the course of Crad COVID Reading. This is actually one of the earliest chronologically stories of Cassie. Um, uh, a couple times you've probably heard a mention of, of Cassie dealing with a Nixie. Well, this is that story. It is called Down to the Waterline, and uh, it actually, uh, thus far, has only appeared in uh, in print on the on the World Wide Web, uh, a magazine called Buzzy Mag, which bought the story back in 2015. And uh, it's a bit of a long story, so I'm going to read it in three parts over the course of this week, starting now with part one. Here is, without further ado, Down to the Waterline, a tale of Cassie Zukov, Weirdness Magnet. Honey, I'm home, I said as I entered my room at the Botroff house bed and breakfast. The ghost of Captain Jeremiah Botroff replied in his usual clipped tone. Ah, you've arrived. Good. I seem to recall you promising to straighten up the floor. It wasn't so much a promise as a hope. I dropped my dive bag on the white carpeted floor amidst the other detritus of my life that I had semi-promised the captain I'd clean up. As I started to pull down the straps of my bathing suit... I headed to the small bathroom in the back. Now, if you'll excuse me, I just finished two dives and I need to wash the ocean off me. Please, at least shut the door before you do that. I turned on the shower, then yanked down my bathing suit and stepped out of it. Oh, come on, Cap. You were married with four kids. I don't have anything you haven't seen before. And if you do, don't, if you see, do see something you don't recognize, feel free to throw a rock at it. That would be rather difficult, given my insubstantial nature. It's a joke, Cap. You must have had humor in the 19th century. Oh, we surely did. However, it had the benefit of actually being humorous, a state of affairs that one cannot be said for what passes for drollery in this era. The Botroff house used to be the captain's home back when he was alive and got rich as a wrecker captain in the 1800s. His shade continued to haunt the place now that it was a B&B &B in the 21st century, one of many ghosts wandering around Key West, Florida. I was the only one who could see or hear him. That was why he generally hung out in my room. I was the only conversation he'd had in 150 years. It wasn't always ideal. The first three months were me being all freaked out over a ghost invading my privacy, and he had issues with female nudity. But six months in, I'd given up on being modest in my own damn home and settled into my role as his Mrs. Muir. After receiving my master's in English literature back home in San Diego, I had decided to celebrate by hopping into my pickup truck and driving across the bottom of the country. Once I'd arrived in Key West, my plan had been to stay for a week here at the Botroff House, spend my days scuba diving and my nights bar hopping on Duval Street. After a month, during which I had completely revamped the B&B's website and decorated it with my underwater photography, the owner, Debbie Delamonica, had offered me room and board in exchange for part-time work helping out at the B&B as needed. Desk work, reservations, airport pickups, more web work, whatever. My parents still emailed me every day asking when I was coming home. I stepped under the blessed hot water as it sluiced the salt off. While Debbie offered me a place to stay, I still needed something that paid. Luckily, Sea Clips, the place where I'd been doing my diving, needed a part-time dive master. So six weeks into my one-week stay, I went from burning through my savings, paying them to take me on dives, to them paying me to take other people on dives. Once I'd rinsed completely off, I came out of the shower stall and toweled myself down. The captain stayed in the main room. I see you managed to once again avoid drowning. Yes, Cap, scuba diving is actually safe. So you insist. I beheld with my own eyes the damage the undersea did to boats made of wood and iron. I cannot imagine why you would willingly expose yourself to such dangers on a daily basis. I went into the room and yanked a bra and pair of panties that almost matched insofar as they both theoretically could be described as white off the floor. Cap, if you could see what I see down there. Then my eyes widened in mock amazement. Oh, wait, you can see because my pictures of it are all over the place. I've seen your photographs taken under the ocean, of course, and they are quite grand. Thank you. But I still consider you mad. It's not fitting for a girl to willingly expose herself to such dangers. I rolled my eyes as I grabbed a red t-shirt with the word expendable across the chest in the Star Trek font. The sexism was something else I had had to get used to. 
After putting on the shirt and climbing into the shorts, I tried and failed to run a brush through the rat's nest I laughingly refer to as my hair, then tossed the brush back onto the dresser in disgust. Sliding into flip-flops, I said to the captain, I'm off to Major Mayor Fred's. It's Thursday, so 1812's playing. 1812 was the house band at Mayor Fred's saloon, my favorite of the many bars on Key West. All four band members had become friends over the past half year. Well, okay, Bobby, Jaina, and Zeke had become friends. Chet was the bass player, and, well, bass players are weird. The forewarning is appreciated. The captain was willing to look at me now that I had a t-shirt and shorts on. The sight of you inebriated is one that discomfits, to say the least, so I will retire to another section of the estate until morning. Oh, come on, I don't get that drunk. You are welcome to that opinion. I do not share it. I shook my head and slid open the glass door. Feh. Mayor Fred's was located on Green Street, a couple of blocks up Duval Street, from where the B&B &B was located on Eaton Street. When I got to the open-air saloon, I noticed three things. The first was that 1812 had a different drummer, and I wondered what happened to Zeke. The second was that Rance Demetrigian was sitting at our usual table near the ficus tree that the bar was built around, which surprised me, since Rance rarely got down here from Miami on Thursday nights. The third was that two strangers were sharing the table with Rance. That wasn't all that unusual. This was Key West, after all, one of the friendliest places in the world, and the seats were at a premium in Mayor Fred's when 1812 was rocking the place. So it wasn't all that much of a surprise if Rance offered this couple, of, uh, this couple seats at our table. And they were definitely a couple, based on the goo-goo eyes they were making at each other and the hand-holding, especially since those hands had matching gold rings on the left ring fingers. I got to the table and said, Hey, Rance! Over the noise made by 1812 playing Lead Belly's Black Betty. Oh, I guess. I was just telling, um... The male half of the couple quickly said, John, and this is my wife, Wendy. I sat down in the fourth seat at the small, round table. I'm Cassie Zukov. Pleasure. Wendy reached out her hand with a bright smile. I returned both handshake and smile. Rand said, I was telling John and Wendy here about Mel Fisher and his whole thing with trying to find gold in the sunken ships for all those years and the entire today is the day bit. In fact, I was about to tell him about his museum, which is great. You really have to go. You can have to borrow gold there and you would not believe how heavy the thing is. I mean, it almost fell out of my hand the first time, which would have been pretty bad since I probably would have dropped it on my foot. I grinned. Yeah, and you're already a flat foot. Looking over at the couple, I added, Rance, here's a federal agent. John and Wendy exchanged surprised glances at that. Quickly, Rance said, it really isn't that big of a deal, honestly. I just don't like to talk shop outside the office. And I keep telling you, Cass, a flatfoot's a detective. A pro the proper old-fashioned slang for a federal agent is G-Man. I said, corrected. I said, contritely. In any event, yes, I'm a federal agent. I've been working in the Miami field office for about six years now, and... I like to come down here to relax and forget all about the paperwork and the other stuff I have to deal with. Besides, everyone asks me if it's just like TV, and it never is, and I kind of get tired of that. John laughed. Hey, at least you get to tell people something cool. We're both accountants. Don't nothing kill a conversation faster than saying you're a P CPA. Wendy looked at me. What do you do, Cassie? Rant spoke before I could answer. It's funny you should ask that, Wendy. Cassie's actually with C Clips, the dive shop I was telling you guys about, and she... I interrupted, since he went and answered the question directed at me. You guys dive? Yeah, but the place we went yesterday sucked. Wendy made a face and immediately sipped her pink drink. I put on my sales pitch voice. Sea Clips isn't the most hardcore place, but it's not one of those shitty tourist traps that throw you in the water, wait an hour, and haul you out after taking too much money, either. It's good for casual divers just looking for a fun dive. That would be wonderful, John said emphatically after gulping some beer. Sea Clips is where the two of us met, actually. Rand said with a small smile. So how long have the two of you been dating? Wendy asked. I squirmed in my seat. We're not dating. We just like to dive and see cool bands. Gina came over to take my drink order, and the conversation went on from there. Mostly it was Rance talking, of course. He was a babbler. But he usually knew what he was talking about, so it was okay. Besides, he had the cutest cleft in his chin. Okay, yes, I might have been interested in him. We certainly spent a lot of time together, but we'd never made any kind of move on each other. John and Wendy left after 1812 did their traditional midnight rendition of the band's The Wait. However, before they departed, I made a reservation for them to take my Friday afternoon dive. Rance had signed up for that, too. Turned out he was down here because his boss gave him a day off Friday. Remember all that overtime I worked last month? Turns out that it wasn't authorized and our ASAC got reamed for it, so in lieu of actually getting paid for that overtime, we're getting regular days off. At one point between sets, 
I chatted with Bobby and Jaina and asked them where Zeke was. Fucked if we know, Jaina said with a snort. We ain't seen him since Sunday. Didn't come to rehearsals, ain't answering his phone or texts or nothing. Indicating the currently empty drum kit, Bobby said, We were lucky that LJ was able to fill in, but he's heading back to Fort Lauderdale after this weekend. I had a lot of beers that night, and a vague recollection of Rance walking me back to the Botroff house at 4 a.m., but I couldn't swear to it. I also may have heard Botroff muttering something about how I was inebriated as usual when I collapsed in my bed, but I couldn't swear to that either. I got up at 11 Friday morning, like usual, and climbed into my bathing suit. After I had some of Debbie's magnificent Kona coffee, I hopped into my truck and drove to Stock Island, the next island over from Key West, to see clips to run my afternoon dive. Hey Cass, I'm glad you're here, Kara Zimmerman, one of the two owners along with her husband, Andy Wasserstein, said when I pulled in. Seymour hasn't shown up today and Andy's already out with Groucho. I tried getting in touch with him every way possible. I even loaded that stupid chat app onto my phone because I know he uses that, but he didn't reply to that either. Did you try Jerry? Seymour Harris was another dive master. He and a young woman named Jerry Nix had been dating for a while now, and they were totally all over each other. Kara nodded. She said she hasn't seen him in a couple days. Says her brother's visiting. Anyhow, Seymour's only had two for his 11 a.m. dive. Can you take them with? You've only got three anyhow. I frowned. I've got four. Nadir canceled. That got me to roll my eyes. Nadir was one of my regulars, but he was the king of the last-minute cancellation. Okay, no problem. Thanks, you're a goddess. I looked over to see two pissed-off-looking tourists. It wasn't like Seymour to just not show up. I took out my smartphone and fired off a snotty text, hoping he'd reply to it and at least feel guilty. Not that it mattered much to me, I got paid the same either way. And Harpo wasn't at capacity even with five paying customers, so it all worked out. But it was mean to make those two wait. John and Wendy had said last night that they wanted to do a wreck dive, so after verifying that Seymour's couple was okay with it, I took the group out to the Duane, a Coast Guard cutter that had been deliberately sunk back in the 80s to create an artificial reef. Since we had an odd number of customers, I put on my wetsuit, attached my regulator and mask, put on my fins, and shrugged into my air tank. You always dove with a buddy. So I went down with Rance, leaving the couples to go with each other. I wasn't as thrilled by wreck diving as the newlyweds. I preferred the natural beauty of the fish and the coral reefs to the artificial crap. But I got the appeal intellectually. At one point, as Rance and I were swimming around the radar mast, I saw a huge mess of bubbles all at once. Rance and I exchanged a quick worried glance through our masks, that was usually a bad sign, and swam down to, see, to the stern to see John and Wendy flailing about like crazy. When I looked past them, I realized why. There was a body floating over the deck of the Duane. It was a white male, completely naked, and pretty far gone from water damage and decomposition. Even with that, though, I recognized the long chin beard and ugly-ass mole on his cheek. This was Zeke Bremlinger, 1812's drummer. Fuck. Rance and I took John and Wendy topside. Rance tried to calm them down. Wendy was just staring blankly ahead while John was just going a mile a minute. Oh my god, what was that? What was that? That, that, that was a body. Holy shit, I can't believe this is happening. That was really a body. Jesus Christ, I've never seen anything like that. I grabbed the radio and called the Coast Guard. The rest of the day was just a huge blur. Rance went into full FBI mode, coordinating with the Coasties and calling in the local cops and the Monroe County Medical Examiner. He also went down with the Coastie diver to photograph the scene before they brought the body up. Wendy didn't say a word the entire time. One of the detectives asked them questions. John did all the talking. As for the other couple, they just looked at each other and said, We're gonna fucking kill Seymour. When we finally took Harpo back to see clips, Rance asked me, Are you doing okay, Cassie? I shook my head. I gotta tell Bobby, Jane, and Chet. They're gonna be devastated. Well, Bobby and Jane are. Chet might blink twice. Honestly, it wasn't just that Friday. The whole week, the whole, the whole next week was a blur. Bobby and Jane were pretty torn up. They'd gone to high school with Zeke. And Chet actually blinked three times. 1812 dedicated the entire weekend to Zeke, closing each and every set with knocking on Heaven's door. Rance told me in a text on Tuesday that, according to the ME, Zeke had been dead for about a week when we found him, which tracked with how long he'd been missing. On top of that, Seymour still hadn't turned up, so I wound up taking most of his dives in addition to my own. I didn't mind the extra work too much, but it was kind of annoying, especially since he usually ran night dives, which I didn't like as much. Zeke's funeral was held on Marathon Key that Thursday morning, and then I had to run Seymour's dives that evening and Friday as well. 
missed 1812 sets both nights. I didn't even know who they were using as a drummer. I didn't really think it would have been right to ask at the old drummer's funeral. Even my usual arguments with Captain Botroff were more subdued, especially once I told him what happened. And then the really, ch the real cherry on top of the shitty week that was being woken up out of a sound sleep Saturday by my smartphone, which was buzzing with a phone call at 9.30 in the morning. A usual day for me involved only encountering one 9.30 per day. This wasn't it. To make matters worse, the call came from Rance, who knew me well enough to know that I was normally comatose at this hour. This dinner was about all I could manage when I answered the phone. Cass, I'm sorry. I, I need to talk to you right now. I'm waiting downstairs, and I've got coffee for you. Fingzel, was all I could say in reply. And then I rolled out of bed, grabbed the first t-shirt my hand could find, somehow managed to get into a pair of shorts that I'm fairly certain I put on backwards, and then stumbled down the wooden stairs in my bare feet to the tree-festooned area between the B&B's two houses. Not a morning person, okay? To be continued on Wednesday, when uh, I will pick up with part two of Down to the Waterline. Uh, this is a set available on Buzzy Mag, uh, which is online. Just look up Buzzy Mag, B-U-Z-Z-Y-M-A-G. Uh, I believe it's BuzzyMag.com, Buzzy and uh, you can read the story there. Uh, and, uh, and it's free. So, uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, check me out online at dekendido.net. Read my blog at dekendido.wordpress.com. And please, if you could support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash cred, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, and I'll see you Wednesday. And please, stay safe.